as a judge, a justice lawyer uh, would be um, one of the primary sort of um, pieces that really assisted me with that work. And also, of course, understanding a little bit more about public inquiries because public inquiries are very different. Um, and I'm now working on my third public inquiry, which most lawyers don't work on this many public inquiries. Um, and definitely every one of them has a theme or a background that sort of has a criminal element to it and understanding what a criminal file looks like and the various government actors that are involved uh, in a, a criminal process are definitely things that I have benefited from. I also, in my uh, work with family law, um, I have used a lot of my understandings of the criminal processes to work with people like, for example, Emma, um, who is who is going to be speaking to you later, uh, understanding some of the resources and um, community-based things that we need to think about when we're working on child protection cases and how can we work with those um, criminal justice systems or what are the implications of some of the things and choices that we might make. So understanding the interactions between the various systems um, and even understanding all of those interactions within the current position. So one of the um, mandates of the current commission I'm working on is the uh, intimate partner violence and understanding the role of intimate partner violence uh, within the context of the commission itself and knowing uh, how that all works and weaves and knits together uh, within the criminal justice system here in Nova Scotia or the, the justice system period has been something that I've um, certainly benefited from them, all of my experience as a, as a Crown and in, in also defense councils because I have worn both hats. Um, the other thing that I did too really early on in my career was I taught um, at the uh, community college in Saskatchewan. So I taught a court worker program, but again, I had already had the benefit of working as a uh, defense counsel. So I had an understanding of the court process and, and you know had an understanding of how it all worked because my role was obviously to teach students uh, in that program what, it, what the role would be of a court worker and understanding sort of all of the processes that, that in the criminal justice system in particular. So uh, in, in the course of my career, which has been very, um, I've had a lot of different experiences and I didn't set out to do that. It just happened that way. Um, I've benefited from the traditional role but I've also had the opportunity to do things that are a little bit different um, and capitalizing on my experience of uh, working in those traditional roles and understanding those processes and then taking those to another um, sort of more non-traditional role, whether that's teaching, working in these public inquiries uh, and understanding sort of how can we do things differently. It also has been something that I've been able to use in terms of restorative um, thinking. So in Nova Scotia, we've had um, some challenges with respect to the GLADU reports, for example, and some of the um, Indigenous um, justice initiatives. So it's been something that I've also been able to contribute, I guess. So I have never been sort of formally paid for or been employed doing that work, but I've certainly contributed to the discussion on some of the um, work that's kind of underway now with respect to looking at an Indigenous uh, justice initiative overall that isn't just criminal in nature. So I, I guess from my perspective in terms of how would you enter this, uh, my recommendation would be that you do have to sort of start with the boots on the ground in the traditional uh, role because from me, from my perspective, the foundational work that I did as a articling student or in my junior years in, in sort of the trenches was the foundation that I needed to do the work that I am doing now. Definitely opportunities with respect to public inquiries, for example, come um, at various times. They're not, uh, it's, it's not a, a consistent type of work. Uh, it's certainly an opportunity to come forward and you know, maybe you can enter the practice of law through that, you know, through an articling process or that kind of thing, or even as a policy um, person, and Emma uh, Cunliffe will speak to that, I'm sure, later. But at the end of the day, from my perspective, if you're asking my opinion as to how would you uh, have the experiences that I've come to 
uh, have, I would say that you would have to start off doing um, the very basic sort of, you know, articling and, in, and get into the trenches because you really have to have a foundation of how the system works to be able to sort of take it to the next level. So those would be my comments with respect to my career path. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was, uh, you have a thank you in the chat as well. Uh, really appreciate uh, the, uh, the comments that you made. Uh, I would remind, uh, remind people that if you have questions, you can um, enter them in the Q&A at any time and we're gonna come back to them um, at the end of the session. Um, we are going to move to the next, our next, uh, our next panelist, um, who is going to be Dr. Emma Conleaf. Um, now, Dr. Uh, Dr. Conleaf is a professor at the UBC Faculty of Law, and she's also, uh, we have the great pleasure of uh, having her here as a visiting professor at the Schulich School of Law. Um, Dr. Conleaf uh, studies how court decide the facts of contested cases, um, and she's particularly interested in uh, expert evidence, the operation of implicit bias, and the legal processes regarding gendered and racialized violence, particularly those regarding indigenous people. Um, Dr. Conleaf is a member of the Evidence-Based Forensic Initiative, uh, which is based at the University of New South Wales. Um, Dr. Conleaf is presently analyzing how facts are found in Canadian trials, uh, in inquests and commissions of inquiry that engage with gendered and racialized violence. Um, she is particularly investigating whether expert knowledge, um, such as forensic medicine, operates as a Trojan horse by which discriminatory uh, knowledge and beliefs reinforce implicit and structural biases within the legal system. She's also studying examples of legal processes in which discriminatory beliefs are successfully countered. Her major work in progress is a monograph called um, Judging Experts. Uh, Dr. Conliff's work is predicated on a careful analysis of trial transcripts and court records, such as expert uh, reports. Um, and she also compares experts work in legal cases against the research based of fields such as forensic uh, pathology. Um, Dr. Khalif uh, regularly is invited to speak to judges, experts, lawyers, and government about the implications of her research. Um, and presently, Dr. Khalif is on secondment as the director of research and policy at the Mass Casualty Commission. So very broad, very broad experience in uh, research, in teaching, in policy. Um, we are very uh, lucky to have Dr. Khalif here with us today, Emma. Thank you very much, Professor Tena, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak. It's it's always a real pleasure to to talk to a group of students who are interested in criminal law, and especially who are interested in finding ways to do criminal law differently. Um, let alone to do it with a with a, a set of pro panelists, all of whom are people that I really admire and whose work I follow. Um, uh, Professor Iftena has given a, a good introduction to my sort of scholarly work. Um, as she mentioned, my day job really is um, I teach at UBC in the Faculty of Law and uh, I teach criminal law and evidence and my research really focuses on uh, factual reasoning in complex criminal trials that involve um, the combination of questions about expert evidence and questions about discrimination and bias, um, particularly bias against uh, women, uh, Indigenous people, people of colour. Um, and uh, I think there's a couple of things I'd really like to echo from what, what Jennifer Cox shared with you. The first of which is that that's, that's not something that I just jumped into straight out of law school. It's, um, I think I had the impression when I was in law school that you kind of figure out what you want to do and you go for it. Um, and that's what you do for the rest of your life. And Perhaps that's true for some. Um, it certainly wasn't true for me. Um, when I graduated from law school, I spent a few years uh, in a corporate firm, interestingly, doing competition law or antitrust law, um, which is, feels like a lifetime ago now. Um, and I joined the firm I joined because it was a small uh, family-friendly practice that had a, a really interesting pro bono program and so that was trying to do corporate law a bit differently um, 
And halfway through my Addison year, it merged with a really big sort of Bay Street style firm and all of that went out of the window. Um, and so that was a very early uh, career lesson in lots of ways in how you can, you can choose what looks great um, and it can turn out to be something very different from what you expect. Um, and what I, I learned a lot of skills from that experience. I, I, I think my, my early work doing competition law litigation taught me how to work with big factual records, which is a skill that I still use in my research and I'm using every day um, in my work as Director of Research and Policy at the Mass Casualty Commission. Um, it taught me how to be organised, um, taught me how to manage kind of multiple demands on my time, um, all of which are useful skills as an academic as well. Um, but it, my heart wasn't in it. Um, it wasn't why I'd gone to law school and it wasn't what I wanted to be doing with my day to day. Um, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do instead. Um, like many of you, I'm sure I felt like I was sort of quite a long way down the law road. Um, and I, I didn't think I wanted to abandon it entirely, but I wasn't sure how it could look different. Um, and so uh, fortunately, and I thank my younger self for this, I decided I screamed and saved enough money to go back and do my master's. And I decided to do my master's at UBC. You can probably hear from my accent, I'm Australian originally, and I'd, I'd been practicing in Melbourne. Um, I decided to go to UBC because when I was at law school, a lot of the most interesting articles we read and the most interesting scholarship and case law we were exposed to was Canadian and particularly some of it came from UBC. So I thought, just go and spend a year thinking about what I want to do next. And I'm very fortunate that having saved some money from my job, I was able to, to, to afford to do that. Um, and that was a really important year for me because it, it opened my eyes to the possibility of a, of a career in criminal law. And my master's thesis focused on the dingo baby wrongful conviction, which you may know from popular culture, um, but which has a whole lot of interesting depths beyond the, the Simpsons reference. Um, and, it, and it sort of gave me a sense that, that some of the value of, of thinking about graduate studies in law is that it lets you think long and hard and deep about some of the issues that I've been bumping up against in practice, but I never had time to really get into. Um, and so at the end of the year of my master's, I really knew that I found the thing I wanted to do. Um, and so I went back and, um, and did my PhD and, and ended up working at UBC. Um, but one of the things that maybe makes me a bit different from some academic colleagues is I also knew, and I knew even then, that I didn't want to just be an academic. Um, I wanted to be what's sometimes called a policy engaged academic. Um, I wanted to be part of conversations about injustice in the criminal law. And my, my research really does kind of work at the, at the intersection of miscarriages of justice and feminism a lot of the time, um, which makes me a bit unusual. A lot, of, a lot of people who focus on wrongful convictions and miscarriages of justice are not, not interested particularly in a gender lens. Um, or in a critical race theory lens, both of which I bring. Um, but I wanted to be part of the conversations that were happening about um, a criminal cases review group, for example, to, to start a current policy discussion. Um, and so I sought out opportunities um, to partner with not-for-profits who might be intervening in cases that I had a scholarly interest in um, to, to appear before parliament to talk about policy issues that I was studying. Um, in order that I could keep up that relationship with a, a different kind of, um, I wouldn't say the practice of law because I'm not admitted as a lawyer in Canada, but of staying in touch with the practice of law might be one way to put it. Um, and I think it was all of that that really probably led to the current uh, secondment that I'm doing, the Director of Research and Policy at the Mass Casualty Commission. And broadly speaking, how my job is a bit different from, from Jennifer Cox's on the day to day. In fact, there's a lot of similarity, I would say, Jen, I don't know if you agree with that. Um, but, but I'm responsible for helping the commissioners put the events, the mass casualty that we're studying in the context of broader conversations around um, subjects such as other, other mass casualties that have happened and the sociological patterns we can identify in, in those. Um, our, our mandate directs us to consider the relationship between uh, gender-based violence and intimate partner violence and mass casualties. Think about policy issues associated with access to firearms 
and so on. And, and, and so my work is to help to put a research and policy context around some of those conversations. Um, and as I say, it's, it's not necessarily the thing I anticipated when I left law school I'd be doing, but it's very interesting and very rewarding work. Um, and so um, if, if I could kind of leave you with, with one piece of advice, it's um, give yourself space uh, to figure out what it is you really enjoy and thrive on. Um, seek out the people who are doing the work that you would like to do and talk to them about it and uh, see if they can help you find your way and be open to new possibilities. Um, but I'll hand it back to Professor Ifkin. Thank you so much, Emma, for that. Um, so we are going to be staying with that in the um, in the area of uh, of policy, um, but also again at a bit of the intersection with uh, litigation. And um, we're going to move to our third panelist, which is Emma Holopern, um, another graduate of uh, of our uh, our law school. We have a lot of great people that are uh, alum and they are doing work in, in criminal justice. Um, Emma is a lawyer, an activist and an advocate who has um, worked extensively on behalf of vulnerable and marginalized uh, people in Nova Scotia. And she's now the executive director and the director of legal services uh, for the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia. Um, which is, uh, which is an organization that is dedicating to, dedicated to improving the lives of women, trans and non-binary people um, uh, and by providing them with uh, comprehensive housing support, uh, innovative program initiatives, just working in justice system reform and through fostering and developing personal uh, empowerment. Um, so um, Emma is uh, able to share with you her experience, uh, both as an advocate and somebody who's working in policy, as somebody who um, has uh, been extensively engaged in non-governmental um, work. So uh, Emma. Thanks. Thanks, Adelina. What an honor to be on this panel of pretty incredible people. So thanks very much. Hi, Jen. <laughs> uh, a lot of people I don't see very often, too, so it's kind of cool to be here. Um, so I think for me, the best way to tell you about how I got to where I am now is actually to start before law school. Um, I came to law school um, from New York City. I am not, I'm Canadian. I was originally from out west, but I've been working for a couple of years in New York. Um, and I was a community organizer uh, when 9-11 happened in New York City. Uh, so it was a pretty wild time to be in New York, uh, a time of incredible turmoil, but also a, a time of pretty uh, amazing uh, and inspiring activism. In it, uh, in, uh, for those of you who would remember that time, of course, there was a, a, a you know an up a swelling of um, individuals stepping up against what ended up becoming the war uh, in the Middle East. And so there was a ton of stuff happening at that time in New York, but I was working and living in a community uh, in the South Bronx, which is a very marginalized community that got sort of forgotten in all of this. So what started to happen was all the funding that had been going into helping quite impoverished and struggling neighborhoods uh, got moved out of those communities and into things like putting security on uh, corners throughout uh, downtown, uh, the downtown core. And sort of, you know, in reaction to what had happened um, at 9-11. And so this was my introduction, I think, into social change work and into activism uh, and into um, community organizing, which is what I was doing at the time. And so, uh, you know, I, for those of you who know a bit about community activism, you're really, you're hitting the ground, you're working with people, you're, uh, you know, you're trying to make policy change and government change, but for, from a very grassroots level. And I found after a couple of years in that work that I really wanted and needed more tools, uh, more tools to be able to speak truth to power, to be able to fight for social change, to be able to fight for, uh, you know, against the injustices that I was seeing all around me in my community and in the world. So that was what prompted me to go to law school. And I was like, one, I'm sure there are some in your classes, uh, you know, one of those people who went to law school and said, you know, I don't want to be a lawyer. I just want to do, you know, social justice activism work. Um, 
And so, you know, I went into that, uh, that coming from a community organization, doing work on the ground. Uh, and funnily enough, 15 years later now, I'm back kind of in that space again. But kind of like Jen, I took a quite a roundabout route there um, and, and have had a number of different careers as I've made my way to where I am now, um, beginning with coming out of law school uh, and into Nova Scotia legal aid. So um, I would agree for me personally, uh, although I was sort of committed to the community sector and to social change work, and that's very much where my heart is, it will always be in the work that I'm in right now, I was really happy to get the experience on the ground for a little bit, um, to, to, to be in the system, uh, to, be, to, to, to see what was happening uh, in the courts, to experience some litigation, to be in that space was, was really valuable for me. Um, and uh, even though it wasn't the career path that I ultimately chose. Um, I think from one of the things that I found challenging uh, when I, uh, you know, in the day to day when I was working with legal aid, which was a, a fantastic period of my life uh, and career, but I found that I was always asking the question of like, I would have a client in my office and I always wanted to understand how do I, like, how did this problem happen? How did this, how did this person arrive here to be in my office at this time? And how do I change that pattern or that path for them? And that was a big challenge for me. And you, uh, for those of you who are familiar with legal aid offices, you know, you might have 200 clients. You don't have a whole lot of time to be working on, you know, fixing the lives of the people that are coming in front of you. And often you're, you're sort of dealing with the things that are, that, you know, the, the matters that are going to court in that day. And, uh, and so for me, I, I started to think about, well, what are the other uh, avenues that I could start to do some of this work that was really about thinking about the changes in the system. Also, by being in court, I had an opportunity to see a lot of the gaps. You know, our criminal justice system has a lot of problems. It still does. Um, and it wasn't meeting a lot of the needs of the people that I was working with and on behalf of. And so, you know, I started to think about what were some of the change mechanisms that, that needed to happen within the justice system itself. And that actually brought me to a period of time working um, in access to justice and equity at the Law Society. So I spent eight years really in the system of the justice system, working for the Nova Scotia Barrister Society with, uh, as the equity and access officer and trying to think about how we in, created more access for, the, um, to, for, for folks uh, trying to access our justice system. Um, in that time though, I, my heart has and continues to and has always been in the community sector. And so I was doing a lot of volunteering and that's how I first arrived um, with the Elizabeth Fry Society. Um, Kim, I'm sure, will tell you about the many years that she was with E. Fry and was, was a, you know, certainly a mentor and um, uh, an, a wonderful uh, example of, of the type of work that could be done working in um, community organizations. And so I started as a volunteer. Um, and that's actually a theme and, and sort of a piece of advice that I would provide. If you are looking for a sort of non-traditional career path in any way, get out there, volunteer, meet people, you know, follow your, oh, it sounds so cheesy, but it really is, follow your heart, start, don't, don't feel that because that path isn't presented to you at, you know, a career development night, that it doesn't exist, uh, you can make the, the those uh, uh, career paths um, for yourself, and in fact, some of the most re rewarding careers come up because you've for folks who have tried different things, have you know explored different options and opportunities, and kind of built something that really works for them, uh, and so some a piece of that for sure, at least for me, was was volunteering, um, and so I you know that started in fact in law school with Pro Bono Students Canada, and I did a lot of volunteering, got to know the community organizations while I was there, um, and then that stayed with me throughout my career. Um, and so I started um, as a regional advocate, so work doing um, prison monitoring work uh, with EFRI, which was a volunteer role, um, and really be 
realized very quickly that this was an organization that met, uh, that sort of checked all of the boxes of what I was looking for, did very important legal work, um, um, provided in, in advocacy and systemic change work in spaces where often there was very little, if any, access to justice, where folks were not um, having access to legal services. So, at, you know, legal aid was not providing um, uh, services within prisons for prison law related act, um, um, activities. And so it was this kind of opportunity to use both my um, professional experience from working in nonprofits and social justice and social change work as a community organizer to kind of mix that with my legal background and my work, um, you know, my, my legal experience. And so I took on the role of executive director with Ephraim Mainland in uh, uh, 2017. So it's been a four, it's been four years. Um, and uh, very, uh, it, this was an exciting opportunity because it, uh, it was an opportunity really to bring the social justice piece of work together with, um, a legal, with legal work. And so what that looked like was, um, uh, what, what is kind of called interdisciplinary practice. And so we have social workers who are doing a ton of work uh, on, uh, and support work and housing workers who are working and providing some wraparound services with legal services for folks who are highly vulnerable, highly marginalized and who are criminalized in our communities. Um, the uh, sort of final piece I'll say about that is that this was an area of law that was entirely unexplored. Um, when I was going to law school, you know, I never heard of prison law. I, it's awesome that we had you have Professor Kenne now teaching prison law. I know that uh, you know uh, Kim has been there and done many intensive courses, but that didn't exist when I was at law school. And so, you know, it, it was really understanding this massive gap. Um, in service and, re and recognizing that the only way that we could provide, that we can start to fill that gap and really only touching the, the, you know, the tip of the iceberg and filling that gap, but the only way that we could really do that was to offer um, so full service that, that was not just legal services, so not just representing people at disciplinary hearings or uh, judicial reviews or habeas corpus, and we do some of that, but also um, doing advocacy work, so writing letters to, um, you know, folks like the correctional investigator, um, of which uh, you will hear from, or the former correctional, the current correctional investigator, the former one, we've been writing letters to them for some time. So, you know, um, that type of work was another way of using our legal skills and our legal tools was not just in the sort of formal litigation um, route, but also in terms of uh, writing, uh, at, you know, advocating for the rights of our of the most vulnerable. And, and that could be by way of, you know, um, taking, you know, speaking to, to various levels of government, writing uh, letters to various levels of government, a meeting with, you know, senior officials, policy uh, officials, and so on, in order to, pr again, press for change. So, you know, at the end of the day, I guess the last thing I would say is um, that the career that I am in today, where we are doing legal work in prisons, where we are, you know, um, uh, you know, offering wraparound services and supports to extremely vulnerable and marginalized individuals um, didn't exist for me, you know, I, I couldn't envision it when I was sitting in when I was graduating from law school. And yet, um, because I sort of had this idea of where I wanted to go, the, what fed me, the, 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 the work that really mattered to me, I was always keeping my eyes open to it and looking at and exploring opportunities that I felt could get me there. And, and that would be sometimes just you know, calling someone up to have a coffee who I thought was doing some interesting work or uh, volunteering at an amazing organization or attending a meeting or attending a presentation and, and sort of building that path for myself. And so I would highly recommend that for those of you who are interested in this. I am just in Dartmouth across the water. So I, and I actually saw a couple names on in the group of folks I know who are already volunteering with Efri and doing some cool stuff. So you're, you're on that path and happy to keep supporting you uh, as you go go through your, your career path and as you start to figure out what your next steps are. I'll leave it at that. I think I've done my 12, 13 minutes and happy to answer questions later.
Amazing. The, thank you so much, uh, Emma, for that and for extending the invitation to our students to uh, reach out and um, and and talk to you and learn more about the work that Ifra is doing and that uh, uh, your career path. Um, now, uh, moving moving on, there is a question for Emma in the in the Q and A box, but I'm gonna hold it until the end. Uh, because others may be able to answer as well. Um, and again, a reminder, feel free to add the questions there for uh, for the end of the talk. Um, we're going to move to uh, Senator Kim Pate, uh, that uh, many of you have known is uh, also a very good uh, friend of the law school and is certainly uh, um, an alum of, uh, of, uh, of Dalhousie. So as I said, all good people, many good people come from here. Um, Kim is, uh, was appointed to the Senate of Canada on, uh, on November 10, 2016. Uh, she first and foremost descri uh, describes herself as the mother of Michael and Madison. Um, she is uh, a nationally re re renowned advocate uh, who has spent the last 40 years working in and around the legal and penal systems in Canada. Uh, with and on behalf of uh, uh, marginalized, victimized, criminalized, and institutionalized individuals, uh, particularly imprisoned uh, uh, youth men and women. Um, uh, Kim uh, has this vast experience in, uh, in advocacy, in uh, policy work, in um, working with the government, working with NGOs, as, uh, as Emma has mentioned. Uh, Kim has also been the um, uh, working with Elizabeth, the uh, Federations of uh, Elizabeth Fry Societies and uh, has been the, the there as well. Um, and she is now into uh, in, in politics as a senator. So very broad experience in uh, uh, criminal justice. I should also say that uh, our uh, students also have the opportunity of uh, interning with Senator Pate um, over summer. So I should keep an eye out on that. Uh, okay, Kim. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for a generous introduction. And thank you for all the co-panelists uh, for all the incredible work you each do uh, and collectively, individually and collectively. I'm pleased to join you from the shores of the Kitchissippi in the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek, otherwise known to many on Turtle Island as Ottawa. And, um, you know, First of all, I want to say I don't talk about working in the criminal justice system because there's not much just about it. I talk about the criminal legal system. And um, unlike probably others on the panel, I, I went to law school to make money. I did. I was a working class kid. I'm the first in my family to get a university education. My daughter a few months ago became the second. Um, I was raised, uh, my dad was in the enlisted ranks in the military. I was, um, uh, I liked women and I was, you know, I, I wouldn't have even known the language then to identify as lesbian, but definitely could not in a military environment of the, of the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. And so when I came to law school, I had a clear plan that I was going there, I was going to, um, I had a backup plan to be a teacher. So I trained first as a teacher at UVic and then uh, went, uh, went to law school at Dell. And, but that all changed when I went to Dell Legal Aid. I was encouraged to do the clinic. I'd done all my coursework. I'd done an independent research project on the youth system because I thought that might be an up and coming area. I might want to do some um, law reform work in that area at some point. Um, the government, I had been speaking to the Department of Justice about possibly working with them. I went to the Dow Legal Aid just as the Young Offenders Act was coming into force. And suddenly I was in an opportunity where most of my um, colleagues, the other folks in the clinic had not, uh, didn't know what the youth, the new youth system was about. Many of the judges and lawyers uh, that we were working with didn't. And suddenly I was on my feet representing young people. I also worked with uh, the women who had come in who were uh, working with uh, some of the community uh, legal workers who were in the clinic and started doing issues with women. And so I had been caught up I'd got a, a position with a law firm in Alberta, and I was planning to do that. Um, I'm probably not the best example to make if, if you're any of you are talking to your families or anybody who's funding your education, if that's an issue for any of you. Because then I, I went to start at the law firm, and I was went from being on my feet every day arguing in my final term at law school 
to sudden, and I should also say that I often was in trouble at law school because if I didn't like the line of reasoning in cases, I would write dissents. When, and that may be acceptable to many uh, professors now. At that time, it was people took a dim view of it. So I often was uh, trying to find ways to work around what the law was rather than to follow the law or follow what the precedents were. Um, and that that continued in the clinic. And um, and so when I went to Calgary and started with the law firm, uh, as many of you know, some of those articles can be um, not as exciting. And so I was writing legal memos. And and so I started volunteering to get some to get some other um, opportunities to work with young people in the system. I had been fairly young when I went to school. I was 16 when I started university and I was uh, 24 when I graduated law school. And um, and so I was, you know, I, th I thought I actually needed to get experience working with, um, with young people because I was so far removed. Look how yeah, that sounds ridiculous now at the, my age, but at the time I thought I'd work, volunteer with young people and I'd um, do the work in the, um, in the law firm. Two weeks into it, I gave my notice though and left after uh, two months. I waited until they had someone to replace me. And I started doing a number of other volunteer activities, but also um, because I had the teaching degree, the, the there were a group of um, organizations, including the John Howard Society and both the school boards in Alberta, in Calgary, who were starting a literacy program for uh, people coming out of prison. So I started working on that. Uh, that led to many other options. I was also doing street clinics for young people, for women, uh, for people who were, uh, particularly in the Indigenous community, who were looking for uh, ways to link up in terms of understanding what their rights were. And so basically try, you know, was doing um, a lot of wage, uh, unwaged work that led to new opportunities. I started one of the first non um what was what was then referred to as a secular it was non-religious based type of victim perpetrator type of um, mediation types of approaches that was now is often referred to as restorative justice or a diversionary uh, started some of the first alternative measures and diversion programs for young people and then for uh, men and into the adult system as well um, and basically kept trying to find new ways to first, the first half of my career I describe as trying to reform the system, improve it, change it. And, and so developing, um, all, you know, a number of initiatives, uh, helped sponsor a number of uh, youth groups and uh, advocacy groups and peer support groups, peer advocacy groups, um, both in Alberta, in Calgary and in Alberta, as well as uh, Canada and with some international links. And then the opportunity, uh, I was actually encouraged by some folks I was working with at John Howard Canada to look at eFry. And so I was able to combine the, the issues that I've been working on in my unwaged work with waged work and started working uh, with women in prison. I was shocked at um, how much, you know, the intersections, it's obvious to many of you now, and especially to those of you who have done the work, um, how the intersections of race and gender and class collide in horrific ways. And so I was shocked by what women were in prison for and also shocked by the lack of access people had to the institutions and the lack of knowledge um, that individuals who were imprisoned had. The, the law becomes characterized as a group, big magical instrument. And, and certainly law schools, um, you know, dine out on the fact that you're supposed to need a law degree to understand what the law is. And I've spent a lot of time both in, the, in you know, I've had the opportunity to teach at, at DAL at, um, in the intensive law program and a number of visiting um, places at, at Saskatchewan. I was there for 18 months, also in Australia and in some spots in the U.S., and have had great opportunities to be and to look at systems in different places. But one of the things that has always shocked me is how much we do, we don't work at making law more accessible. And so that became a big function of it. And Emma's already talked about the regional advocacy teams. That was something we developed because we wanted to have a team of people who could be accessible to the women. Most most every team, um, I, I suspect it's probably so, but Emma will correct me if I'm wrong, had someone who had legal training, um, at least a couple of people who had them, their own lived experience of being criminalized and imprisoned. Uh, we were working on, and it came to fruition not long before I uh, went to the Senate, 
uh, to have women who are actually in prison as part of the advocacy teams, because of course you come into, anybody who comes into the prison goes out again. Uh, we negotiated access to the entire, uh, all of the prisons so that we could actually see the conditions of confinement and document them, not just to rely on uh, the only authority that usually documents that, which is corrections itself. Um, I also had the privilege in um, coming to Ottawa, uh, being involved in a number of advisory bodies um, from the Parliamentary Budget Office to the Auditor General to a number of others to um, guest, guest sessions and guest uh, um, opportunities in, in various departments. Also had the opportunity to start doing work with training other professionals, not just law and legal professionals, but social workers, doctors, uh, psychologists. And in all of those areas, one of the things I found was vitally important was to really talk about the need to decolonize, decriminalize and decarcerate our thinking, our minds. And, and so I would characterize the, the last 20 years as really being about how, how do we actually do what uh, a number of you have already spoken about, and I suspect others will as well, which is to stem the tide of those ending up in the system. And Yesterday in your class, Adeline, I showed a chart that we've done of uh, just what has happened as we've tried to make progressive trends to reform, for instance, the over-incarceration, the mass incarceration of Indigenous people, Indigenous women in particular. And when we started that initiative about 30 years ago, uh, women were about 10, 11% of the federal prison population. They're now, as Ivan has well documented, almost 50%. And so every Every progressive attempt to remedy those situations has paradoxically resulted in those of us in the system uh, feeling better about, I'm being a bit facetious if it's not obvious, about putting more people in the system because there are special circumstance courts, there are Indigenous programs, all of those realities. And so really... Uh, uh, the, the reason when I was approached by a group of Indigenous women who asked if they could put my name forward for the Senate about um, going to the Senate, one of the things that was attractive was the ability to work on issues that have longer term, uh, broader national uh, interests like how do we rebuild or build, some would say, I certainly agree with that, a strong economic, social health uh, safety net or net or a rebound, I, I think, try to think of it as a trampoline, where people who are temporarily uh, not able to be supported in the community can rebound out of those situations. Oops, that's my timer telling me to shut up. So that, so really in the Senate, I've had an opportunity to work on private legislation. Um, I try to, in a principled way, make sure it's, uh, those are issues the government has indicated they were going to work on, but then have not picked up. So things like mandatory minimum penalties, things like record um, conviction expiry, things like uh, judicial oversight and remedies for prisoners when the law is not adhered to. Um, things like the Human Rights uh, Committee report on the, the rights of federally sentenced persons and um, continuing on to take uh, senators into prisons. I often joke and say not the way some people thought they might go, uh, but taking members of parliament, senators into prisons and encouraging the judiciary to also continue. Because for me, the, what Louise Arbour urged everybody um, a decade or more ago uh, was that any of us who are working in and around the criminal legal system who don't know what the conditions of confinement are to which people will be subject if they are imprisoned have no business, whether it's policing, whether it's prosecuting, whether it's um, defending, or whether it's uh, being a judge, or whether it's making the laws as a member of parliament or senator. Uh, so that's really been uh, vitally important. And I would absolutely underscore what Emma said in terms of both Emma's, but Emma Halpern said in terms of volunteering, uh, many of the opportunities that have arisen have come in suddenly someone says, you know, have you thought about this? Would you like to take this opportunity? And ultimately, um, it's great to have a plan, but I encourage you all, if you have a passion for something, usually if you have a passion, it's about something you do well. And if you do it well, you that passion continues to grow and encourage. And many people uh, will often say, you know, do you never feel burnt out? And every day that I have the privilege 
opportunity and responsibility to walk um, with folks who have lived experiences sometimes similar and sometimes very dissimilar to mine. It's a huge opportunity and huge responsibility and is uh, enthuses and, in you know, really um, is what encourages me to keep doing this work every day. And I encourage all of you, you're the leaders, you're coming, um, you're, you're already leading many of you and you will continue to lead. And so I hope you keep in touch and I look forward to following your careers. Thank you so much, Kim, always such a pleasure uh, to, to hear from you. Um, Moving on to another uh, Shulik Law alum, um, we're having uh, uh, Cherry Spain uh, speaking, who, who is a lawyer and a public servant. So we are moving into the uh, more governmental uh, side of, of the work. She currently holds the role of manager special initiatives for victims with the Nova Scotia Department of Justice uh, Victim Services Division. Uh, Cheris has an undergraduate degree from Dalhousie and a JD from Dalhousie's Schulich School of Law. She practiced law for seven years in the areas of family and criminal law with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Justice and then with Nova Scotia Legal Aid. Um, in her role as manager of special initiatives, Cheris works collaboratively to develop innovative initiatives to increase access to justice for survive, survivors of violence in Nova Scotia. Her work specifically focuses on intimate partner violence and sexualized violence. Cheris's work centers uh, trauma-informed and intersectional approaches to understanding and responding to violence in order to meaningfully serve survivors, recognizing the intergenerational, historical, and systemic nature of trauma and violence, and how this impacts the experiences and needs of, survival of survivors of violence. Uh, Cheris, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's been amazing uh, to hear uh, everybody speak uh, this evening. So um, similar to Emma, I believe uh, in order to be able to tell you how I, how I arrived here really starts uh, prior to uh, law school. Uh, I'm an African Nova Scotian woman who was raised uh, here in Nova Scotia. Uh, and I started my professional career before law school, working uh, as an executive director of a youth and community development organization uh, that you know, dealt with tutoring programs, after school programs, uh, breakfast, breakfast and lunch programs uh, in uh, underserved uh, communities. And uh, while there, I asked myself a similar question, you know, how did uh, many of the youth who were dealing with uh, significant complexities in their life, how did they arrive, you know, where they arrived? Um, and that's what led me to law school, uh, a constant fascination with the intersections of violence and justice, uh, both institutionally uh, as uh, intersections of violence and justice and interpersonally. Uh, and so uh, I went to law school uh, because I thought that the law held some of those keys uh, as to how we as the collective we and individuals uh, who find themselves at the mercy uh, of our legal system find themselves in these places. Um, and so uh, I kind of just uh, fell into some experiences uh, after law school, uh, also agreeing with Jennifer uh, that uh, I, I think it is important to practice. And one of the things that uh, was important to me was to practice. And I told myself I'd practice for five years. I ended up doing it for seven. Um, and, uh, and I always had a goal to transition into uh, policy and program and service delivery uh, type of work. So I started uh, my articles with the Nova Scotia Department of Justice, uh, where um, I, I had varied experience. And I asked anyone who, any lawyer that would give me, you know, an opportunity to learn something, to be in a courtroom, to take a file, uh, to represent a client, to write a, a, a memorandum or a factum. I took that opportunity from many different uh, 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 types of practice areas there. And I got the opportunity to do 
uh, some child protection litigation, which allowed me uh, to be in court. Um, I also uh, uh, completed a secondment uh, with the Public Prosecution Service during my articles, which also allowed me to be in court and see those intersections of justice and violence uh, uh, play out. Uh, and then after I finished my articles, I moved on to the uh, Saskatchewan Ministry of Justice, where I worked uh, in uh, its child protection uh, practice group. Uh, after that, I moved on uh, to Nova Scotia Legal Aid, uh, where I did a lot of child protection work representing uh, parents, uh, did work in therapeutic courts such as uh, domestic violence court. Uh, I transitioned uh, into my current role as manager of special initiatives in July of 2020. Uh, and as was already stated, a major focus of that work is on intimate partner violence uh, and sexualized violence. And so uh, while I was practicing, it, 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 it was funny how constantly those intersections from my prior to going to law school between violence and justice kept coming to the fore. Many of the clients that I represented uh, in family litigation had their situations exacerbated due to violence. And a huge part of my role as an advocate in a courtroom was to try and help a survivor uh, be able to rebuild the pieces of their life, gain security and economic independence uh, after experiencing you know, sometimes many years of violence uh, uh, from uh, someone who caused them harm. And being and, and trying to find ways to craft, you know, for the court to help them apprehend and understand how to balance, you know, the safety of survivors and children against the rights of the person who caused harm, right? How do you weigh those two things? And sometimes that was very difficult uh, in a court of law. And again, led me you know, to, to kind of find a, a bit of frustration, feeling like working in that uh, micro level every day uh, with clients, you know, how do I you know, help them uh, uh, improve uh, the, the, the circumstances and the situations of their lives? Um, that led me to understanding and practicing you know, trauma-informed lawyering, which really helped uh, me in the work that I have, that I, that I undertake now. Uh, and it wasn't common uh, for, for lawyers to practice um, uh, in, in family law in particular. And so I moved on uh, to the Department of Justice, as I said, in July of 2020, looking at things from a more macro level, right? You know, why are there uh, uh, certain barriers uh, to, to survivors and victims being able to achieve access to justice uh, to achieve greater justice outcomes and what ways are we thinking in limited perspectives as to how we can give meaningful uh, representation to the needs of, of survivors and a lot of that comes down to for me again a deepening always a deepening of understanding violence and justice right um, understanding intergenerational trauma understanding uh, that people show up uh, already having been harmed uh, by the systems that purport to serve them, right? Uh, many times victims are re-traumatized uh, by having to testify in court, uh, by uh, uh, individuals uh, and, and system players that don't necessarily understand their unique needs and what they have gone through because our system as it's currently uh, uh, configured doesn't necessarily have room for the voices uh, and experiences and needs of victims. And so a lot of what I do is helping systems to understand how are we trauma informed and how can we do no further harm? And how can we look at our policies and our procedures and the ways that we carry out justice uh, that is the causing further harm? How do we restructure and reimagine the ways in which we do our work? Um, for instance, you know, we've been uh, in a time uh, where 
uh, what was considered innovative were uh, victim, uh, victim impact statements and testimonial aids. They were innovative for that time, but we are moving into a time where we have to have a, deep, a deeper understanding of trauma, of violence, uh, and how our systems uh, uh, play that out uh, in the lives uh, of survivors and have to develop greater responses uh, to be able to deal with that. Some of the work that I do tangibly uh, is I uh, manage a roster of lawyers uh, who provide independent legal advice uh, to adult survivors of sexual assault. Uh, and while uh, that uh, program is intended to give further information on civil and criminal processes uh, to survivors in an effort to increase reporting, there's still more work that needs to be done. So a huge part of my responsibility is educating lawyers in that program on how to be trauma-informed. How do you argue cases from a trauma-informed perspective? How do you elevate a judge's understanding by bringing a different argument? When, when, when do, you, do you object to certain lines of questioning, right? Uh, and so currently I'm in development of uh, an educational program uh, and curriculum uh, that will help bring more of that information and understanding uh, to lawyers, uh, which we hope uh, to uh, provide more extensively uh, throughout the province. Uh, but ultimately, that's the work uh, that I do uh, in a nutshell. I would also agree uh, with uh, the other uh, panelists here tonight that you need to follow your passion your passion uh, and your talents. Do as many things as you can until you figure out what you're really good at and then find out what you're really good at and what you really like and try to combine those things. And your journey never ends. Everything is all about learning, right? If you follow your passion, you will find yourself in different places throughout your career uh, that sometimes you might be a system actor the next time uh, you might be uh, working in community. But as long as you find your passion and you follow that, you will, will create a career and build a career that you're proud of uh, and one uh, that uh, will definitely uh, be the sky's the limit for you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Cheris. That was actually so inspirational for me. I, I, I hope that it was for our students as well. Um, thank you again. And uh, last but not least, uh, staying with in the area of, uh, of the uh, public service and government, um, we have um, Dr. Ivan Zinger, who um, is uh, currently the um, Correctional Investigator of Canada. Um, he has received uh, his common law degree from the University of Ottawa and has completed his articles with the Federal Court of Canada. Um, he has obtained his PhD from Carleton University in psychology of criminal conduct. Um, he also teaches as an adjunct professor with the law department at Carleton. Um, Dr. Zinger uh, joined the Public Service of Canada in 1996. He held a variety of senior managerial policy and research positions in public safety related federal departments and agencies. In 2004, he, um, he joined his current employer, the Office of the Correctional Investigator, which is, um, for those of you who don't know, is the like a federal prison ombudsperson, om ombudsman office. Uh, the Correctional Investigator is the ombudsperson um, that uh, monitors the federal correctional uh, uh, system and uh, conditions of confinement. Um, and in 2009, um, uh, Ivan became the executive director and general counsel. As of uh, January 1st, 2017, Dr. Uh, Zinger was appointed as Correctional Investigator of Canada pursuant to Section 161 of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. Uh, Ivan, thank you so much for uh, being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Adelina. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and to have an opportunity to uh, actually uh, talk to students about uh, uh, career plans and, and career paths. Um, I'm going to try to uh, go a little uh, further back than um, uh, when I completed my uh, law school at uh, Ottawa U. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to start with um, uh, childhood. Let's let's start there. 
Um, I have very little recollection of, of, for example, when I was four, five, or six years old, and I don't remember, um, you know, I, I have no recollection of whether at that time I wanted to be a firefighter, uh, a police uh, officer, or a doctor, or maybe even a soldier. Um, but there's one thing for sure that I know is uh, is that I certainly didn't uh, uh, dream about becoming the Correctional Investigator of Canada. Um, uh, most of my career, I, I feel that uh, uh, was filled with uh, great opportunity. I feel sometimes a little bit like Forrest Gump that uh, uh, go through time and then there's all these uh, uh, these wonderful things that uh, happen to to him. Um, and uh, I can tell you, I wasn't very good at school, uh, uh, elementary or, or high school. And uh, when it came to uh, university, uh, my choices were limited because of my poor uh, grades. Uh, so I actually um, uh, was only accepted in two university uh, with open door policy at the time. I, I don't think those uh, exist anymore. Um, uh, the, the policy. Um, so I was accepted at Université du Québec à Montréal, de Lucoam, and Carleton University. Um, I uh, was not, my English was not uh, very good, uh, but I thought that it would be a good, uh, it would be a, a, a best uh, option to try to stay away from Montreal and the bad influences of Montreal and uh, try to um, come to Ottawa and uh, make, uh, uh, make my mark there. So I uh, uh, started with, um, uh, at Carleton in a, in a sort of, a, uh, I think it was a bit of, a, it was a psychology, it was psychology with a bit of a criminal justice um, and a bit of law. And I, I sort of found my way. I started really enjoying uh, anything dealing with the criminal justice. I found that it was fascinating. Uh, so I initially actually uh, volunteer for John Howard Society, uh, which gave me some summer job even with the Ottawa police at the time. Uh, and then further on uh, uh, gave me an opportunity to work uh, uh, with uh, young offender phase one. So those that are uh, 12 to 15 and secure custody. Uh, I've also worked in halfway houses and so on. So I really thrive on the uh, on, on criminal justice uh, issue. I, I find it uh, fascinating and um, uh, and I really sort of uh, wanted to uh, continue to pursue that. Um, uh, I was a bit of a slow learner because um, I stayed in university a little too long. I actually uh, ended up spending 13 years. So I, uh, any of you that wants to follow my career path is probably uh, would be turned off by that. I, if I would actually, if I knew that I was gonna spend 13 years when I started, I would have probably gave up right away. Um, so uh, I uh, sort of fell in love with psychology or criminal conduct and um, uh, at the end of my uh, BA, uh, honors BA, uh, I wanted to actually go into, um, to do a PhD, a clinical PhD in psychology of criminal conduct um, and actually applied. So you, there's a couple of programs where you can go straight from a, a four-year BA into a, a clinical uh, degree PhD that would last at least six years. Uh, and I was accepted, but but no one picked up my file to supervise me, so I was disappointed. Um, so I I did what I uh, uh, always do throughout my career is that I try to uh, open various doors and see what's what's the best option. So I was accepted for um, I think a master in social work, uh, master in psychology. Um, and I was persuaded my, by my late wife at the time to actually apply to law school. And then I looked at the opportunities and I sort of said, okay, well, you know, um, uh, I will try law school for at least a year and see if I like it. Um, and I started law school. And I have to tell you that initially, I certainly didn't uh, uh, like it. I, I, uh, um, I, liked, I liked uh, social science. I liked uh, uh, sort of... Um, uh, very much uh, uh, social justice issues. 
And 25 years ago, I can tell you that there were not that many people uh, in, in law faculties that had uh, similar uh, uh, background. Um, mo most of my colleagues were driven to go into corporate law and, and, uh, um, and were looking at private, uh, uh, private law firms and so on. Uh, so I didn't like it very much. And I actually applied again for that uh, same uh, a PhD in psychology, clinical psychology. And again, I got through the, uh, the first stage but, um, of admission, but no one picked up my files. There were only a, a couple of people doing uh, uh, forensic uh, psychology at the time, and they already had uh, their hands full with uh, previous students. Um, so I decided again, uh, because I knocked at a few doors, nothing open, I will do the best. So like that, I never have any regrets in life. Um, I'll say, I'll, 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 I'll finish it. So I did finish it, um, finish law school and it, it got better. And I sort of figure out, uh, uh, I think the first year is always difficult as, as many of you know, and then eventually you, you find your, uh, your groove. And I was able to, uh, 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 to, to make my way. So I finished law school, applied everywhere, uh, got into federal court, that was great. Uh, finished that, did the bar, uh, that, that was okay. And then when I graduated, the, the, uh, I, I knew that I didn't want to do, um, uh, to be a traditional lawyer. Uh, it, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, something I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, basically work for the public, uh, uh, the public sector, not the private sector. I didn't want to count my hours or minutes, uh, you know, while billable hours and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, so the market there was a hiring freeze in government. Uh, I I um, I was really uh, down, not knowing what to do, and I sort of said, you know what, I'm gonna. Um, uh, pursue my uh, uh, my academic dream of of doing a PhD, and this time I, I just went and I uh, went to see uh, my uh, former um, uh, thesis advisor when I was at uh, uh, Carleton uh, undergraduate, and I say, if I do apply, will you pick up my file and can I uh, can I do my uh, PhD with you? And he said yes. So I did apply and I started part-time my PhD uh, to, uh, you know, which I wanted to do for, for so long uh, in criminal, in, uh, in uh, psychology or criminal conduct. Um, so um, uh, after that, I guess I, uh, um, I did some contract work uh, to finance my PhD. So I did uh, research contracts with Solicitor General on dangerous offenders. I did some with the Department of Justice, uh, also on long-term uh, offenders as well as dangerous offenders. Um, and what I did is that a lot of that work I could actually um, use against my, my PhD. So that was great. Um, and, uh, and eventually I finished all the course requirement. And, and at that time, uh, I had no uh, thesis topic um, and I, uh, uh, all the course requirement were done. I did my uh, comprehensive exam on psychopathy. So that, that was done. Uh, and my thesis advisor said, uh, why don't you meet with a former, um, uh, a former student of mine, his name was Larry Mochak. Uh, he's the head of research at Correctional Service of Canada. And maybe he can find something for you to do uh, your thesis on. Uh, so I did. Uh, Larry is still with Correctional Service of Canada. He's now the assistant commissioner for policy and research. Um, and uh, I arrived there in uh, uh, 1996, just uh, a couple of months after Madame Justice Louise Arbour um, uh, tabled her uh, uh, amazing report uh, on prison for women. And it was a land of opportunities for me because I was brand new uh, lawyer with some, you know, clearly some uh, uh, interest in research. Uh, and they tasked me with, uh, uh, despite the fact that I was in research, they tasked me to uh, put together uh, the um, uh, legal training for senior managers in response to recommendations 
uh, from uh, Madame Justice Arbor. So I hired a couple of uh, law students and we developed uh, the leg legal education module um, uh, in response to Arbor recommendations. Um, uh, after that, they asked me to uh, be part of a, to actually do a bit of a research for the task force on administrative segregation. And the next thing I know, um, I was asked to be part of the task force and uh, I would be able to do my, uh, my PhD research uh, on administrative segregation or the psychological impacts of administrative segregation. Um, then uh, as I was doing that, I was also asked by the Commissioner of Corrections uh, to be part of a working group on human rights uh, that was uh, chaired by the former commissioner um, of a uh, chief commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, uh, Maxwell Yaldon. Um, and he wanted somebody who could write and who hadn't been, as he said, hadn't been absorbed by the culture of uh, Correctional Service of Canada. So the commissioner asked me to, to sit with, uh, uh, on that working group. Uh, and this is where I really cut my teeth on the uh, sort of uh, 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 learned uh, the, the ropes on uh, domestic and international human rights standards uh, as it pertained to uh, prisoners. Um, so um, again, nothing was planned. Um, I then, uh, uh, I did finish a PhD and then I uh, decided to move on. I was hired by Solicitor General at the time as a senior uh, advisor. Uh, then I moved to the Department of Justice. I wanted to get some managerial um, uh, uh, sort of experience. Uh, so I became the principal researcher for criminal law policy. So I was uh, in research at Justice supporting the policy uh, sector for criminal law. Uh, Rick Mosley, who's a, a judge by now, uh, was the uh, assistant deputy um, minister at the, uh, at the time, responsible. Um, and after that, I, I was brought back to Solicitor General that turned into uh, the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness uh, as the director. So finally, I had a managerial position, director of uh, strategic policy. Uh, and I was responsible for a lot of things, uh, including uh, uh, provincial, um, uh, territorial, um, uh, federal, FPT, federal, provincial, and territorial uh, meetings of ministers or deputy ministers responsible for justice uh, and public safety. Um, so it was uh, really uh, uh, high level stuff and it, it was a great exposure for me. Um, and then uh, finally, because of personal situation, I decided that I, I could not uh, no longer work in a big department, uh, giving, uh, giving the kinds of hours that I was uh, required to do. So I um, uh, approached um, Howard Sapers, who was the uh, just brand new uh, correctional uh, investigator of Canada in that small little shop. Um, that at the time, I think we were about 25, we're up to 40 now employees. Uh, and then I worked for him for a dozen years uh, in various capacity. And, uh, uh, and then eventually when he left, I, I took over the, the top job. Uh, so again, um, you know, in terms of my own career, I, I think I, I, I feel excessively uh, blessed by uh, having uh, had the chance to make a contribution um, to the through the public service, and uh, uh, I'm uh, one of the maybe rare, maybe a little bit rare uh, individuals that work for the the uh, public service that is uh, excessively happy with uh, how I was uh, treated and all the opportunities that I had. Uh, I've done a fair amount of international work as well throughout my career. So in terms of reflecting, I've got, uh, I, I'm just about uh, over, uh, uh, over the time limit now. Uh, I would just, uh, you know, um, say that, you know, drive for, for always for excellence in everything that you do. Uh, I think when I look back at my career, I think this, uh, 
multidisciplinary approach is the way that I distinguish myself from from the rest of uh, of uh, law students and uh, and uh, employees at the public service because I I had that uh, that uh, uh, combination. So I, if you um, if you want to distinguish yourself, I think disciplinary studies is the way to go. Um, and I've also was interested in in management. Uh, so this is one way that you can ap apply. As I say, law was never an end for me. It was more like a tool uh, to achieve that end and to be in a in a position where I could uh, hopefully contribute to uh, social justice. Um, and and law was just absolutely fundamental to my ability to uh, uh, to uh, uh, see the world and advance um, and advocate for uh, for those that are less fortunate th than us. So I'll leave it to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, that was actually such a treat hearing your whole career path. I did not know any of those. Um, uh, thank you for uh, for being here with us tonight. And I'm going to, um, as we have a few minutes left, I'm going to uh, um, go over the, uh, the the a couple of questions that we have in the Q and A. If people have any other questions, feel free to sort of add them. Um, I uh, it's an it's really. Um, such a, a wonderful privilege to be able to hear about your careers, all of your careers, and to hear about all of these uh, incredible uh, paths that are very different, but there are certainly um, a lot of common themes before uh, uh, among that. And and um, I, I love uh, Ivan's idea of law as a tool, as and as uh, as opposed to as an end. And I think that hearing um, uh, about the work that you do and knowing the work that you do, I think that that's something that uh, probably applies to to all of you as the way you use uh, um, law as a, a tool to try to um, work for uh, for better uh, for better outcomes for uh, uh, the people that you work with and to advocate to through through the various ways. And um, I think that uh, you know the themes that we've seen developing um, and that. I think uh, the, the students can also sort of um, reflect on or, or try to um, to think on on how they can they can approach them in their own path um, relate to this idea of volunteering, trying different things, trying to find out what your what your passions are, um, networking with people, reaching out to people. Um, uh, trying to to not uh, settle, trying to do what you think you would like to do, and and uh, persevering until you you love that, and ultimately um, uh, the, the idea that I think that all of you have reached that thing of, that that passion uh, uh, has materialized in the work that you do and have done such significant contributions to uh, to the public uh, well being, and you have served the communities in such and are serving the communities in such incredible ways. So uh, we thank you for that. We thank you for taking the time to talk to us, and um, I'm going to start with uh, a, a couple of uh, one of the questions. I think that. Um, uh, uh, somebody's asking, and I think that everybody in 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 the audience, uh, you know, would is admiring your careers and and the work that you're doing. Of course, um, the concern on everyone's mind uh, would be, you know, um, what are we doing? Considering we do want to do this, we want to uh, pursue a largely volunteer social justice sectors out of law school. Uh, but what would be your advice for somebody who's graduating with ninety ninety thousand dollars in debt? How how do I um, am able to navigate through that? Uh, and still do the things that I, that I like to do. I'm going to ask Kim, I know Kim has to leave soon. So I'm going to um, uh, let Kim answer that first and then see what others have to say. Kim, I think you may need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Famous. Um, yeah, and I'm very sorry that I have to leave to go to another class that I agreed to speak at um, after this and uh, with uh, um, so I, 
I, it's actually part of the reason that I talked about, uh, well, first I want to say, of course, I'm in a very privileged position now. I have resources, I have salary, I have benefits. Uh, but when I was choosing, quote unquote, uh, to take to work in the nonprofit sector, a big challenge was as a single mom, how I was going to afford to uh, raise my kids in that environment. And so um, my, you know, I often say jokingly, but it's true that being raised in the context in which I was without much in terms of financial resources set me up very well to work in a, in a sector that isn't well resourced writ large. Do I think it should be? Absolutely. Am I working to try and change that now in the context? Absolutely. Um, so many times I would actually volunteer as I was going through, whether it was training or um, law school, before law school, after law school, if I wanted to get certain experiences, I've worked, you know, in a wide array of uh, areas and I won't bore you with all the details, but um, in each of those initiatives, I would basically start out and go to an organization or an individual or a group or a coalition that I wanted to work with and say, look, I really think I can learn a lot. I think I can contribute. How about if I work for free for you know, when I was trying to get a job as a dental assistant, um, I worked for half a day free. When I wanted to work with a coalition doing uh, work with kids on the street, I worked for a week free. And basically tried to get some of that experience that way. Um, I also did things like go without a car for a while. I red circled my salary when I was with the National Office of E-Fry up until I was getting ready to leave. I was planning to leave just to regenerate, to try and generate new energy in the organization before the Senate thing happened. Um, but before that, I uh, red circled my salary so that we could always hire someone coming out of prison, preferably someone serving a life sentence or a long sentence so that they could move into the position. And so, you know, that's that then led to creative thinking about, you know, um, other people I was working with said, why don't you start teaching? So I did some fellowships and, uh, you know, was able to uh, resource in those ways. So I think often it's the creativity of linking up with and working in collaboration with others. It's also that kind of collaboration that led um, me to end up working with some amazing lawyers who um, I was their client because they wanted to work on the issues we were. And so linked to the second or the, the last question about how do you fight for these issues? I think um, I always say, know what your theory of your case is. So that's why I said, you know, decarcerate, decriminalize, those sorts of um, big term objectives. When we went into the Arbor Commission, we had a clear um, interest in not just trying to fix a few things, but, you know, looking at things like how do you have real meaningful oversight? What do you do about a skewed, racist, gender biased classification system? And so some of the recommendations that come out of these can be very much shaped by the input you provide and who you choose to represent you when you're doing that. Um, it's also why, how I ended up getting, um, you know, my fourth degree was a postgraduate in forensic mental health because I wanted to be able to help shape that thinking as well. So I think there are creative ways to do it. And um, if anybody wants to be in touch, you're more than welcome to email or call us. And um, uh, it, it's always easy to find us. Our senators are Kim, our names, first name dot last name at sen dot parl dot gc dot ca. Uh, so feel free to be in touch if there's anything further that I can assist with. And thank you very much, Adelina, for organizing this. And thank you to all of you and uh, everybody for all the incredible work you do. Thank you so much, Kim, for that. It was uh, lovely having you here tonight. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody else wants to add any ideas in terms of um, this conundrum of trying to follow your passion and do social justice work. Um, and, and I'm going to throw another question in here um, that somebody is asking, because I think it's somewhat linked to it. And they said, um, many of you mentioned the value of the skills you gain from corporate law opportunities. Um, and of course, this is somewhat, somewhat linked to um, this is somewhat linked to the idea that a lot of the the, the money to pay the debt may come from there. Um, is there any advice from somebody who really does not want to do any big firm uh, kind of work and just wants to stick with social justice work? Is really any kind of big firm necessary for those skills? And are there any other avenues? So that linked with the with the money part is a question, and I'm going to have Jennifer uh, answer that first. 
So with respect to opportunities um, that are salaried and decent salaries, there's lots of opportunities now within the legal aid system in Nova Scotia. And I'm going to suggest that probably in other parts of Canada as well. So because we have the specialized courts, um, therapeutic courts, as they're called, uh, we have uh, social justice initiatives. Um, there is a specific uh, em uh, employment opportunity with Nova Scotia Legal Aid, for example. And those are reasonably well salaried positions, um, basically the standard of what you could expect in, in the practice of law. So I would say to those who are interested in this area, one of the places that you should be looking um, is uh, to Nova Scotia Legal Aid in particular, or to firms um, that maybe do some of this work because there is particular firms who do like certificate work or who, who have some opportunities to sort of liaise with that. The other thing is, is that you can certainly do crown work. Uh, so a lot of the victims of crime and are those people that you all, you know, those are people that the crown works with. And it's just because you're the crown doesn't mean you can't learn and, and advocate um, for change. You can be a trauma informed crown prosecutor. You can find ways to change the system from within. So um, you don't necessarily have to find a corporate opportunity to find a good, um, especially those first few years. I mean, really at the end of the day, you make more money as a private lawyer uh, typically, anyway, I wasn't one of them. Um, in, in those later years, anyway, it's those first few years, you tend to actually make more money as a salaried employee, um, either with Nova Scotia Legal Aid or, or one of the, um, the institutions. So it's not as hard as you might think it is to find a decent salary to pay that student loan. So I guess it's, it's not a one size fits all answer, but there's always opportunities if you're looking in the right places. How's that? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to have um, Emma Conliffe now, and then the other Emma, and then Charis. Thank you, Adelina. I was just sending you a note saying go to the hands. I just um, <laughs> I just hit, hit it. Adelina up in the chat and said I could talk a little bit to both questions. Um, to the question that was asked about corporate law and the skills you get from corporate law, um, you can get the same skill set uh, working for Nova Scotia Legal Aid, working for eFry, working for Victim Services. Um, and so please don't think that those, that there's something special about corporate law in that sense, there actually really isn't. And I think that's a lot of the mistake that corporate law sometimes pushes on uh, law students. Um, and it's, it's false, <laughs> having worked in a number of different settings. Um, I can tell you there's, I value the experience I had because that's where I got it. It's not the only place to get it. So, so I felt I should probably speak directly to that having, having raised the issue. Um, to the question of graduating with debt um, and, and how that might constrain your choices, um, I was in that position. Um, and um, that is why I went to corporate law because from my vantage as a, possibly somewhat naive kind of law student that seemed to be the, the path um, to financial security. Um, it's not the only path and, and I endorse entirely what Jennifer said and I think one of the things that I've, I, I noticed from my BC vantage uh, talking to a Nova Scotia audience um, is take account of cost of living when you're thinking about salaries as well and so uh, looking to smaller centres, looking to opportunities where you might be being paid similar amounts of money, but the cost of living is going to be less, um, is one way to make sure that you can have a decent lifestyle um, without needing to go to Toronto and work on Bay Street. Um, but the second thing, the reason why I emphasised the idea that the first thing you do out of law school doesn't have to be the last thing you do in your legal career, um, is because it may be necessary um, for you to take a job that wouldn't be your first pick because you can't afford to take the one you really want to do. And, and if that's the case, that's okay. Um, it's okay um, if, if that's what it looks like. Learn what you can from that experience and commit to yourself to making the time to, for example, volunteer um, with an agency that is providing the kind of work that you might want eventually to be able to find a way to make a living doing make those connections um, and and see if you can get the debt paid down a little bit um, maybe get through the early years of your kid's life if, if that's part of the the story um, and keep 
kind of putting uh, keep keep your kind of one or in in the work that you really want to end up doing um, if that's the financial necessity for you there is there's no no problem with that it doesn't make you less committed or less passionate to the work it actually keeps you in the pool and so so do what you need to do to get to where you need to be thank you so much emma uh the other emma hey um so i'll answer those questions but then also try to answer i think there was one that was specifically directed to me so i will certainly try to get to that that's one right well. that would be great if you um you that so well. In terms of, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this as like the most terrible answer in the world, but I'm gonna say it anyway, which is that like some of it sort of depends on how comfortable you are with living with debt. I also graduated with a massive, massive debt and just sort of paid it off really slowly for many, many, many years. It didn't like cr cripple my life. Uh, I think it took me almost 16 years to pay off my student debt. Um, but you know, I still had a great life while I was living. It, you know, it just comes out of your bank account. You don't even really notice it. As long as you can like at least get that minimum payment. Terrible advice. Your parents will kill me. Uh, but but seriously, I for me, it wasn't worth it to sacrifice what I wanted to do in order to get that debt paid off quickly. And I know that for some people that weighs on them heavily and like they can't just live their life comfortably with the with that debt debt at the back of their mind. And for those people there, it, then take some of those other jobs that maybe get you a bit more pay and get that de debt paid off and, and then take, you know, do volunteer work on the side or move to another career after you've made a bit more money. Like the options are endless. I think that's the main point and it is so individual. So for me, the debt didn't bother me that much paying it off slowly. Uh, whereas you know, I really wanted to do work that was that I had to right off the bat. Like I just couldn't go and do work that I, I I'm just one of those people who just kind of had to follow my heart from day one for the most part. And and to Jennifer uh, uh, um, uh, comments, legal aid pays perfectly fine. Like maybe you're not going to be on a trajectory to make you know half a million dollars a year in in ten years, but you are still going to be making one of the you know some of the better salaries of of any Canadian out there. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of jobs that, it, that and even, uh, you know, I have an articling job that I, um, you know, at a, at a nonprofit, like I have a staff articling position and we pay a decent salary. I can guarantee it's probably not quite as high as some of the big firms, but it's not terrible. So I think uh, this, it's a little bit in my view anyway, a myth that sort of, you have to sort of literally live the life of a pauper if you wanna do social justice work. I think you can live a decent life. You're just maybe won't have a yacht by the time you're 45 or 50, you know? And to write, frankly, there are certain jobs in law where that's a possibility. Uh, and and that, but this, but working in nonprofits not going to do it for you. So um, uh, to the question though of volunteering, I, I I I would say, and it was sort of for someone who doesn't have the networks and who's maybe a little bit more intimidated, I think was the question around kind of putting yourself out there. I would say that this is a, it's incredibly valuable experience to just put yourself out there, you know give someone a cold call someone to say, I'm really interested in the work you do. I'd love to just grab a coffee. People do this with me all the time and I benefit from it. I love meeting students for a coffee and talking about the work they're interested in, their careers. It, it's wonderful and it's really rewarding. I get, you know, this. The, I can tell you without question and I know some of the participants on here are my pro bono students, we couldn't do anything, any of the work we did without student volunteers. I That's the core offering that we offer is a, a great group of brilliant students at, year after year who are who who do fantastic work and it is how you know an amazing way to give back but also I can tell you from what I've heard from other students it's some of the best experience they get in law school because it's so hands-on and you're working on real files real people's lives real work um, and if you really feel intimidated to put yourself out there, I, I highly recommend Pro Bono Students Canada. They'll place you for you. So just put your name in the in the box, and the, and they'll find a placement for you. Um, I've also had professors refer people to me. So go talk to one of your professors about your interests. They may know some community organizations. Um, and I'm not saying you know 20 hours a week. You, you just get yourself out there a little bit here and there, and you'll have that exposure to the way in which law impacts 
impact the lives of the people in our communities. And that is so tremendously valuable. And then the final thing I would say is do the clinical work. If you, if you don't have time at all, some people are working, have children, all that, I get that. Then take some of the clinical courses like, uh, like the Crim Clinic or Dal Legal Aid Clinic, because that also gets you that exposure and out there and meeting people and have that kind of opportunity. That's amazing. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Cheris. Uh, yeah, just to add and, and hit home some of the points uh, that other uh, people made on the call. Um, so I, it did bother me having debt right out of law school, which is why I went to Saskatchewan. It's why I left the Department of Justice, Nova Scotia, and went to Saskatchewan. And I was able to pay my debt, right? Now, I wasn't living in a remote area in Saskatchewan. I was living in Regina, but it was still very cold, right? And I lasted maybe two and a half years, right? But it was a choice I made because I knew that I, I, I needed to get that debt for me, you know, uh, to a manageable place, right? And so everybody makes choices based off cost benefit analysis and what the, you know, the configuration of their life is, but there are options. And while I was in Saskatchewan, what I wasn't uh, prepared to realize is what Jennifer said. I was a crown in terms of I was working for the Ministry of Justice, representing them on child protection matters. And I had so much power, right? Because I was the filter through which that evidence went to the court, right? And if the social worker providing me with the affidavit information did not justify the interventions that she was taking in a way that I felt as an officer of the court, I was prepared to advocate for, I did not. And so I wasn't always liked initially, you know, <laughs> but I, I developed a reputation of somebody where you knew you had to show your work and you had to justify it. And that power made it easier to be able to be in a very cold place for two and a half years and learn a lot. Also, you don't know what you're going to be exposed to. I had an opportunity while I was in Saskatchewan to take part in a legislative review of the child uh, and, and family. Uh, um, I'm, I'm forgetting it now, but uh, you, you know what I mean, the, uh, the Child and uh, 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 Family Act out of my head now. Um, but I had a chance uh, to uh, participate in a review of that as a practitioner, as somebody who was in the court every day. And you know, my comments mattered, right? My view of things mattered. And that was an opportunity for me to engage you know, in activism and social justice, particularly thinking about the fact that we were dealing with huge indigenous populations in Saskatchewan who had been dealt with unfairly and continue to be dealt with unfairly. So always remember that as an officer of the court, there is a level of power that you have and you can always choose to practice in a way that is in alignment with your values. And then the other thing is, as you go, I've only, I've only, I only practiced for about seven years, right? As you go along, you will be able to make choices where money is not the paramount consideration in what you decide to do. It will happen. It doesn't always feel like it will happen, but it will happen, right? And as you build skills, you can, I would advocate for anybody to do this and encourage anybody to do this. Start to try to find ways to make money for yourself. What skills do you have? Can you consult? You know, can you, um, what can you do? What can you offer an organization, right? Uh, in, in terms of skills that can develop you, give you some additional money and you be able to leverage that into perhaps a business for yourself at some point. So just things uh, to think about. That, that's excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Cheris. Um, I don't know, Ivan, if you want to add anything to this. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's uh, uh, the landscape changed so much. Um, you know, law school used to be, uh, you know, 25 years ago was the same price as going in any other faculty. Um, my daughter just uh, finished law school and uh, I guess her tuition was, uh, you know, a little over $20,000 a year. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a very different uh, um, uh, landscape than when, when I went through. So uh, I was a, a very much a, a bit of an entrepreneur and, and it was clear to me that uh, 
I did not want to accumulate any debt while I was studying for 13 years and I, I succeeded, but I was working basically either part-time or full-time during the whole time. And I don't think that's possible anymore. Um, so I, 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 you know, I feel, uh, uh, I feel bad for, for the way society has gone by making law schools more uh, exclusive to get in um, and having uh, so many people that, uh, uh, that are dedicated, that uh, get the marks uh, to uh, leave law school uh, with uh, significant debts that uh, can feel certainly at the beginning overwhelming. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think a, a law degree is a, is a wonderful opportunity and it can open lots of doors. And as the other speakers have said, um, you know, do what you have to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, if uh, you're passionate about social justice, but where you want to be doesn't really pay very much, then, you know, you'll cut your teeth and do something else that do pay. And then eventually you can later in your career give back by, uh, uh, by, uh, by dedicating more of your practice or, or or your entire time to uh, social justice issue and advance things. Um, so I think it's just a question of, uh, of timing um, sometimes. Um, but as I say, I, I feel bad that law schools have, uh, have become what they've become, which is uh, uh, certainly uh, much more uh, uh, sort of they, they, uh, they, they, it, it takes quite a bit of money and lots of people have lots of money in law school because it's more affluent um, uh, families that can, uh, can support their, their kids to go to law school. So that's just unfortunate. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, we are significantly over time, but um, uh, maybe uh, we're gonna end on this note. I think it's a really interesting last question where it's moving from how you get there and moving from the debt and the money. Um, it's, it's, it's about the substance. So, you know, somebody says, um, that this fight for social justice can be very motivating. However, uh, there is also a lot of disappointment in it. And how do you manage the disappointment and not feeling like the cause is lost when policy and law fails to keep up with what must change? So how do you, I think it's a really good way of ending. It's so obvious what are the benefits and the aims of the work that you're doing, but how do you manage the disappointment when you feel that you spent 20 years and you're at a standstill? Uh, Jennifer. Not a lot. Lots of tears. <laughs> lots and lots of tears. Uh, Jennifer, <laughs> that thanks Emma. You're such a uh, bright light there. For, for me, um, I just didn't I didn't like let go of it. I like so although there's disappointment and you get frustrated and there's lots of hoops you have to jump through, you know, the changes in the legislation here in Nova Scotia are primarily as a result of my tenacity to sort of stay at it. Um, so the opportunity presented itself and I took, seized the moment. So I think that's the thing that you have to be mindful of is that it may not come at the time you expect it, but it'll it'll never be for naught. You'll have that opportunity and, and just do the work to prepare so that you're ready when, when the opportunity presents itself. Thank you. Uh, Emma, can live. Yeah, it's funny how we all winced at this question. I think that's because we've all lived it. Um, don't accept the first, second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth loss or knockback. Um, do actually read and study the careers of people who've made really significant change and you'll see that they didn't accept the first, second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth knockback. They kept coming back and kept chipping away and, um, and, and it is a skill. I think for me, um, the, the, the place where my head went immediately was, was the case I wrote my PhD about, which um, I argued a woman had been wrongly convicted. She's still in prison in Australia. Um, but the most recent development in her case is uh, last year, 90 scientists, including three Nobel Prize winners, um, signed a petition saying that she'd been wrongly convicted. And I could never have imagined when I was sitting in my bedroom writing my PhD that, that it would get that sort of attention. But I'm also acutely conscious she's still in jail. Um, 
And so the swings are, are crazy when you do this work. Um, and um, the best advice I can give is surround yourself with people who care just as deeply about what you're trying to achieve as you do um, and do the best work you can with the people who are your allies in that work because they're the ones who get you through the tough times and who help you get back up on your feet and do it again. Um, but, but that is the nature of this work. And I think that a lot of times it feels when you're doing the work that nothing is changing. But I think when uh, looking from the outside in, I think that the importance of that work and the things that, um, for instance, even just these people in the panel have achieved looks very different from the society's point and from the point of view of people outside. While when you're doing the work, it might not feel like you're getting where you want to do. So it's also a difference between the subjective perception and the reality of the importance of, of what has been achieved, right? Um, Cheris. I would just say uh, the thing that's helped me most is the resilience of the, the people that I have had the privilege of, of helping. They are resilient, right? And in the face of that, um, you just don't give up. You know, I when I worked for Legal Aid, I was in Cape Breton, right? Beautiful. I loved the experience there. One of the things I loved about it is that when I went to the grocery store, I would see my clients and they would stop me and show me pictures of their children and how they're doing, right? And let me know that they've got a job or, or some other significant milestone in their life. And that definitely helped me get back up every day and go and do this work because people are resilient. Thank you, Cheris. Uh, Emma, you wanted to develop on your crying? <laughs> Although I'm joking, there is some reality to that, which is that like, it is okay to feel all of those complex feelings that you will feel when you are often up against the wall. Uh, and I would say I have this conversation with my staff team almost every day about, you know, what you need to do to kind of dig deep and keep going and appreciate the very, the small steps that get made, even when you feel like you've just been pushed back, you know, another major step and every step forward gets us a little bit further along in the journey. Uh, I often talk about sort of like chipping away at the wall, uh, but eventually those chips do uh, make a full <laughs> hole uh, in the system and the systems that have quite frankly oppressed and harmed so many people that we are up against. Uh, uh, all the time, and I, you know, I, 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 I agree. I think with what the other Emma said, which is, you know, who surrounding yourself with people who support you, people you can talk to about it, um, feel it, you know, allowing yourself to 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 cry sometimes, to be angry sometimes, uh, and then to get back up the next day and and keep going uh, because it is a. No, it, without question, it is the hardest part of my job. And I, I had um, someone recently say to me who, who does kind of on the ground kind of grassroots systems change work. And he said to me, you know, it's not ever the clients that, are, that you know, cause me to burn out. But it's the it's the system. It's the state. It's the, up, the everyday kind of feeling like you're batting your head against the wall. Um, uh, but yet you do, you have to, to Jennifer's point, like, you know, you, uh, you see these things afterwards and you have to take the time to appreciate them. Those, the, the, there are changes that are being made. There are, uh, and, and we, I look around and I look around at this panel even, and uh, there's all these people in this panel who I admire and look up to and have seen do amazing work. And, and I, that for me is, it is rejuvenating. That for me gives me like, my feeling that I can keep going, I can keep doing this work, and that I need to keep going and doing this work uh, um, for the next person to look up when they're feeling frustrated and down and struggling to see that I'm still here <laughs> doing the work. Uh, and so that's, you know, there's no magic to it, but uh, have your people uh, be kind to yourself and, 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 keep, and keep going. Thanks so much, Emma. And Ivan, we're all really very interested in how you're coping and making the same recommendation year after year for the Correctional Service Canada. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I think sometimes it's uh, masochism, but uh, I think I think the, the, there are two things. We, we tend to um, 
celebrate even the smallest of wins. So I think you have to, every time that you uh, have a win, you have to take the time to, to celebrate. Um, uh, so big wins don't come very often, but uh, if you focus on the little ones, um, so we make a lot of recommendations uh, to wardens uh, and most of them and many of them get implemented, uh, but we are batting average when we make uh, larger recommendations for reforms that are typically directed to uh, uh, either the Commissioner of Corrections or, or the Minister or the Government of Canada. Those tend not to, uh, our batting average is rather poor. Uh, so celebrate the little wins. And I think the um, uh, the second thing that I think is is uh, in our business line of business that will keep you sane is to keep a sense of humor because uh, uh, so um, you can do your job exceptionally well and see very little movement, uh, but uh, you know you you've got to uh, to have a sense of humor with the people surrounding you and and uh, uh, I think that that helps uh, cope with uh, with uh, all the adversity in the world. Thank you so much, Ivan. And um, thank you so much to all of you once again for uh, partaking in this discussion, for sharing your experiences with us, your thoughts and um, your, your suggestions and your careers are truly inspirational to our students. So we're very lucky to have been able to um, share a bit of that with them. Um, and uh, yeah. I think uh, the video will be available uh, on uh, in the next couple of days for those who want to uh, watch it or share it. So yeah, thank you very much and have a good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>